Hello there and welcome to this video. Now, as promised, I'm doing a video about gravity. Gravity is one of those things that flat earthers have a lot of problems with and they simply deny its existence. Um, I've been doing responses to Dell at Beyond the Imaginary Curve. He's been going out on the streets and demanding that members of the public give him examples of gravity or try to explain it to him or account for it in some way. Um, now, what I'm going to do in this video is go through a series of examples that should convince you that there is such a thing as gravity. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not offering an explanation for why it's there, how it works. I'm just going to go through examples that should convince you that it exists. That's all I really have to do. Now, I don't need gravity to prove that the Earth is a sphere, but it's a, bit part, a big part of our understanding of why it is a sphere. So it's worth going through. Um, so, well, what is gravity? Well, essentially, gravity is a force. In physics, there are, it's considered that there are four fundamental forces. There's electromagnetism, there's the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. Now, the strong and weak nuclear forces only apply in the nucleus of an atom, so they don't directly affect our lives. They do in the sense that the universe couldn't possibly exist in the way that it does if it wasn't for them, but we don't experience them directly. Electromagnetism pretty much accounts for everything in the world as we encounter it. It explains light, it explains the structure of electrons electrons and atoms, which subsequently explains chemistry, which explains ultimately biology. It explains why you can't put your hand through a wall. Um, pretty much everything in the world, except for a few things. It doesn't explain radioactivity. It can't explain nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. And also, it can't explain a whole series of phenomena that we attribute to this thing called gravity, the fourth force. Well, okay, so what is a force? Forces affect changes in the world. So, for examples, in our everyday life, forces could deform an object. They could compress an object, stretch an object. They can bend things. They can make things move, make things accelerate. And when a force is being applied, what we say in physics is that there is work being done or energy is being expended. So work is being done to change the world in some way. Well, let's consider some simple examples of what we would intuitively regard as exerting forces. Now we can exert forces on the world because we have a hard skeleton inside our body and we have muscles which can push and which means we can push and pull things. So therefore we can exert forces in the world. Everything that we do essentially is, I mean even just picking up a cup you're exerting forces. So let's consider a really simple example of exerting a force which would be stretching a spring. Now, a spring is a coiled piece of material, usually metal. It has a length that it's in equilibrium at. Now, if you stretch it, it wants to pull itself back together again. So you've got to work against that force that's trying to pull it back. So to stretch a spring, you need to do work. You need to exert your muscles. In short, you have to exert a force on it. To stretch a spring, you must exert a force. Similarly, as stretching a spring, you can compress a spring. So to compress a spring, you have to push it together. Now, in this case, the spring wants to push back out again. So you've got to work against the spring trying to push back out. And the key word there is work. You've got to do work. You've got to compress. You've got to use your muscles, you've got to expend energy in order to do this. So that must be exerting a force. Well, consider this example. You attach an object to a spring 
hold it vertically. And what does the object do? It stretches the spring. And eventually it will stop and it will be in equilibrium and the, string, the spring will be stretched. Now, what happens is the object pulls the spring and as it pulls it, the tension in the spring increases to the point at which the tension equals the amount that the object is pulling it and it will just stop like it is there. So this would indicate very, very strongly that the object is exerting a force, that there's a force involved. Now, we call that force the weight of the object. So every object has a weight associated with it and it's the magnitude of the force that we say gravity is exerting on it. There is clearly a force pulling that object down. Now we don't know of any way of explaining that using electromagnetics or any other force. It cannot be understood in terms of electromagnetism. If it could be, it would have been explained by now and we wouldn't even have a theory of gravity. What we call gravity would have been absorbed into electromagnetism, but it can't be done. And this is clear evidence that there is a force being exerted on an object. And like I say, we call that force weight. And similarly, um, you could put an object on top of a spring and it will compress it. Now, as I've already discussed, to compress a spring means to be exerting a force because you have to do work in order to compress the spring. So if you're compressing a spring, you're doing work. Okay, let's consider another example. Supposing someone held out a plate in their hand and you blindfolded them. Now you could push down on the plate with your finger and in order for the person to keep their hand where it is, they'd have to start exerting their muscles to push up against your finger. Now you could also place an object on the plate and it would push down. Now to the person holding the plate who is blindfolded, those two things would be physically indistinguishable from each other. So again, it's extremely strong evidence that the weight of an object is a force. In fact, in what sense isn't there a force at work there? It's a bizarre claim. Um, let's consider another simple example. You have a plank of wood between two supports. Now you could push down on the middle of the wood with your hand and it would bend the wood. Alternatively, you could place an object on the plank of wood and it would bend the wood. It would affect the same physical change as you exerting a force with your hand. Again, indicating very strongly that objects have a force pulling them down towards the ground. And again, as I said, we call the magnitude of that force the weight of the object. Now, another thing that forces do is they make things accelerate. If there's acceleration, there's forces. Now, when you hold an object and you drop it, what happens? It accelerates. If it's accelerating, there's a force. Now, here's another very familiar example. I'm sure we've all done this, stood on bathroom scales. What happens? You compress the scales and there's a scale that measures your, well, what we call weight. Now, this is unfortunate because in physics, the proper definition of weight is a force. Now, we might say that we weigh so many pounds or so many kilograms. Now, that's in everyday language, which is unfortunate, like I said. What you really mean is that your mass is so many pounds or so many kilograms. And what you're doing with scales is that you're using your weight to measure your mass because your weight is compressing the scales, which causes that dial to turn and you can use that to measure your mass. Now if you got down on your 
on the ground and push down with the, on the scales with your hand, you could affect the same change. You could make the dial turn by exerting a force on the scales. So again, it's very strong evidence that your weight is a force. Okay, so what determines the magnitude of the force being exerted on an object? It's weight. What, ma what determines it? Well, very simple. It's mass. You double the mass, you double the weight. The evidence supporting that is completely overwhelming. You can demonstrate it like in this, that you can see in front of you here with a spring. Now, generally, a, a spring can be very closely approximated in its behaviour to something called Hooke's Law, which says that the amount that a spring will be extended is directly proportional to the force with which it's been pulled. So when you attach two masses to a spring of equal mass, it stretches it twice as far as, ju as just one of them. And if I go back to that, that's what you're doing there. You're using the fact that your weight is directly proportional to your mass to measure your mass. The weight is the force with which you're pushing down. There's a force pulling you towards the ground. Now, is the weight of an object related to its density? No. Absolutely zero evidence for that at all. And you can know that for yourself because, as you can see in the picture in front of you of a crushed up car, if you take your car to the crushers, they'll crush it up to a box like this. Now, because <coughs> you've taken your car and crushed it up into a smaller volume, it means its density is increasing. But it will weigh exactly the same. You do not increase the weight of an object by increasing its density. Now, this is where the confusion arises with density, and this is what flat earthers really seize upon. It's this thing called buoyancy. Now, you only get buoyancy when you have an object in a fluid. Now, a fluid could be a liquid or a gas. And the reason for that is because fluids, like, like water in the example you can see here, exert pressure on everything around them and everything inside them equally all round. Now, because there's this weight pulling, because everything's got weight, because there's this force pulling it down, it means when you go deeper into water, you've got the weight of the water pushing down on you from above, which increases the pressure, which means you get this thing called a pressure gradient. The deeper you go, the deeper the pressure. And that's a real thing. That exists in the atmosphere. It exists in the oceans. The flat earthers make out that that's an impossible situation, but it exists. There is a pressure gradient in the atmosphere, and there is one in the oceans, and it's because of this. It's because of the weight of the fluid from above pushing down. Now, because there's a pressure gradient, it means that if you have an object inside fluid like you have in the diagram here, the force pushing down from above is very slightly less than the force pushing down from pushing up from below. Now the difference between them is equal to the weight of water that would occupy the same volume as the object. So if the object has the same density as water, it will have the same mass as the amount of water that would fill that space. Therefore, if you put an object in water that has the same density as water, it will just sit there. It's just sitting in the water. Similarly, if you have um, a balloon which is the same density of air, it's got the same overall density as air, it will just sit in air. Um, now, if the object is more dense than water, then it has more weight than the water would have that would have been there. 
and it can overcome the upward pressure in the water and that's why it sinks. If it's less dense than water, it doesn't have enough weight to compensate for the difference in pressure between the downward force and the upward force. Therefore, it starts to move up because it can overcome the upward pressure in the water from below. That's buoyancy. You only get it in a fluid. And it can only be explained by gravity. It's a direct result of gravity. It's not an explanation for everything that we attribute to gravity. That is ridiculous. Flat earthers have got this bizarre idea that it's just to do with density, that things just sort themselves out according to their relative density. There's no evidence to support that idea. It didn't even make sense. Um, I mean, if you had an object, a physical, a solid object, and there was a pocket inside it that was slightly less, that was less dense than the rest of it, there's no evidence that that little pocket of that's less dense is trying to move up because it's in a solid. You only get it when you have a fluid because fluids exert pressures on things. Um, so you can't account for everything with, bu with buoyancy. It's, it's just a completely ridiculous notion. Uh, yeah. So here you can see an apple being weighed in something called a spring balance or a Newton balance. And you can see that the apple clearly has weight or a force pulling it because it can pull the spring in the, in the Newton balance and the little gauge moves down. Now, that means that the earth is pulling the apple with a force that is directly proportional to the mass of the apple. Now, Newton's third law of motion tells us that forces always come in pairs. So if you exert a force on something, that thing will exert the same a force on you of equal size but in opposite directions. So according to Newton's third law of motion, which has never been observed to be violated by any experiment, the apple must also be exerting a force on the earth, which is directly proportional to the mass of the earth. So it's reasonable to assume from these simple observations that things attract each other with a force that is proportional to the mass of both of them. Now, it's not just dependent on the mass, it varies with distance as well. And we get this thing called an inverse square law. Now, there are lots of inverse square laws in physics. And the reason we get inverse square laws is simply because we live in a three-dimensional universe. Say you have light being elim uh, illuminated from a, um, spreading out from a point in space. Now you can imagine it expanding in spheres. Now, as it expands away from the point, the light has to spread itself over a larger and larger sphere. Now, the surface area of a sphere is proportional to the square of the radius. So, for example, if you double the radius of a sphere, you times the surface area by four. If you triple the radius, you times the surface area by nine. So the surface area increases with the root this, in proportional to the square of the radius. And that's why we get this inverse square laws. So you'd expect that the force to, would drop off with the square of the distance. And that leads us to Newton's law of gravity, which states that between any two given objects, say of mass m1 and m2, they are attract, there's a force acting that is proportional to the mass of both of them, m1 times m2, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them, and also multiplied by this constant g, which we, I won't go into in this video. But I think that I've given you very good reason to accept that this is true from the simple observations I've made in this video that I think you can all agree are true or you could test them for yourselves.
the evidence that there is a force pulling things towards the ground is just completely overwhelming. I mean, ask an engineer or an architect if they're building a bridge or they're building a, a building, they have to take the weight of the bridge or the building into account, which is a force trying to pull it down. And they have to counteract the force, the weight of the thing that's trying to make it collapse. I think an engineer or an architect would laugh at you if you said there's no such thing as gravity. Everything we know about the world we live in tells us that there is a force pulling everything towards the ground and that that force is directly proportional to the mass of the object and is not related to the density of the object. And the only way that density becomes a factor is when that object is in a fluid. And it's not true that dense things always fall. Stones, which are denser than soil, rise in soil. So that, the idea that buoyancy is some general principle that explains everything we attribute to gravity is absolutely ridiculous. So if there's flat earthers out there, you explain to me how it is that we, a force, can stretch a spring, compress a spring, distort a, a piece of material, bend a piece of wood, in effect, do anything at all that you would intuitively regard as exerting a force, and yet there's no force. What do you mean by that? Well, thank you for listening, and I hope this convinces you that, yes, there is such a thing as gravity.